Welcome back to another episode of Rednecks Rising, the anti-capitalist, anti-racist Appalachian podcast that's dedicated to busting the myths and stereotypes around Appalachia. One interview and ADHD-fueled history lesson at a time. I'm your host, Chelsea. I'm from the Great Smoky Mountains of Southern Appalachia and Western North Carolina where I grew up and I have stayed put ever since. I never could bring myself to leave, but I did go about studying community organizing and social work. And I've been a community organizer right here in my hometown for about a decade now. My journey over the last decade has had me working in electoral politics, issue advocacy, grassroots power building, and in general talking to hundreds, if not thousands of folks across Western North Carolina learning people's stories and hearing about their struggles and watching them step into their power and their healing if given the opportunity to do so. And now I am passionate about the crossover and social policy and internal, interpersonal, and collective healing. I try to use this podcast as a platform where we lean into and explore that crossover by switching between solo episodes and interview episodes. When it's just me by myself, I dive into topics about Appalachian history, culture, and whatever else tickles our fancy to peel back the layers of truth. In our interview episodes, we aim to talk to folks from all across the region who are doing good work on the ground to bring our community closer together in one way or another, whether that's through mutual aid, storytelling, music making, abortion access, harm reduction, and so much more. And that brings me to today's episode. Today, I decided to just let my ADHD run wild and dig even deeper into the nuance and context of the mind workers unionizing attempts and the mind wars and how it all connects back to race and capitalism and colonialism in a way that I want to get just a little bit more clear on for myself. At first, I was following through history chronologically, but I actually think that it's about time for us to start letting ourselves just explore the spokes of the spider web when it comes to labor and race because that's what it is it's a spider web it's not always something that can be explored in a linear fashion because of just how intricately everything is connected throughout history so today we let ourselves spin off into that web and bring together some pieces of history a little bit more clearly we take ourselves on a journey from the modern day all the way back to the Virginia Slave Codes and a little bit of everything in between. But before we dig into that, let's grab a rag and take care of some housekeeping business, shall we? First things first, I need to give a shout out to my dear friends and comrades, Johnny and Mouse from the stellar band Tell Light Rebellion. They helped me out with some sound mastering for the podcast. So if you notice that the quality sounds a little better today, maybe it's a little clearer, a little louder, especially if you're typically listening in a loud spot like a tour van with lots of road noise, then you have them to thank for that. Thank you so much, Johnny and Mouse. They were playing some music out in our neck of the woods and they made the time to swing by my spot, even came grocery shopping with me because life never stops and I had some errands to run. And then they set me up with some new skills and some new apps to make this podcast top notch. We're improving every day and it really does take a village. Please check them out if you don't listen to them already. They're on basically every music platform that I know of at least. And I'll make sure to link to their Spotify profile in the show notes. Thank you so much, y'all. It was so good to see you this weekend. And as a friendly reminder, you too can get a shout out on the show or on our social media. Also by supporting the podcast. And there are lots of different ways to do that. But two of the least time consuming ways to support us are one, you can head over to the Ko-Fi page and that's where you can contribute financially, either one time or on a monthly basis. You can also purchase some merch if you want to get something in exchange. And then the other way, the second way that you can support us without taking a whole lot of time out of your day is by subscribing to us wherever you're currently listening and make sure to leave us a good review and share us with your friends and spread the word either verbally or on social media where you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. It is also officially the beginning of August, y'all, which means that we, for the very first time since we launched, will be taking half of the profit that has come in from the Ko-Fi supporters over the last seven weeks, and we will be donating that half towards the Pulaski County Free Store. 
I do plan on giving y'all like a whole financial summary and all that jazz at, at some point in time, but honestly, these past few weeks have been quite a doozy for me, so I just haven't had the time or the energy to even look at that between the toddler and the day job and, and being a human, but I promise I will let y'all know what that looks like in the next two episodes. And finally, that brings us to your favorite part. The trivia question of the day. Hey, Chelsea. Howdy, Chris. So for today's question, the name Appalachian was not commonly used for the entire mountain range until the late 19th century. Before that, what was it known as? Well, I'll be. I did not know that it was ever known as anything else. I can't wait to hear today's answer. All right, y'all, stick around to the end of the episode and you'll find out the answer to today's trivia question. But for now, let's dig into today's entree, the meat of the episode, shall we? As I was researching, uh, well, really just kind of lost in a rabbit hole of research, rather, I came across this article that quoted uh, Martin Shkreli, and I, I have no idea if I said that right, Um And, you know, I think he put it better than I could ever hope to for an introduction to this episode when he was explaining his exponential increase in the cost on a pharmaceutical life-saving drug. In his own words, he said, this is a capitalist society, a capitalist system, and capitalist rules. In the words of a capitalist, this is a capitalist society that pursues profit over all else because that's what capitalism is all about profit i ended up looking up the word just to be sure and you know the word capital and capitalism is derived from medieval latin capitale capitale capital i don't actually know how to say that either sorry y'all gonna butcher the pronunciation of a lot of stuff today i guess uh which was essentially stock or property right property and also from the noun use of uh, Latin capitalis, which is like capital, chief, first, like foremost, right? So property at the, at the front, basically money and property at the center, at the forefront of everything, not health and well-being, not community, not human survival and evolution, money, money, property. So anyways, in this society where profit and money are the top priority, what happens is that businesses are less concerned with the quality of their production, but are actually more concerned with the costs related to production. And so they cut every corner possible to eliminate their expenses and increase their profits. And one of the big expenses that tends to get cut in a society that prioritizes property over human life is the cost of labor, which means that wages say stay stagnant or even decrease and so-called unskilled workers that are looked down on while our society depends on the labor that they provide, they are struggling to survive and they're incentivized with the threat of punishment in the form of stripping what little access to survival they do have. The gap of inequality grows wider and wider and the presence of poverty grows deeper and deeper. Capitalism has always been a brutal, violent form of economics that is rooted in the devaluing of all life, including human life and the resources that allow life to flourish. From the moment that this continent was colonized for the purpose The purpose of colonization was to produce wealth for the British elite. From the moment that that happened, brutality and violence were accepted as measures for creating that profit by whatever means necessary. And slavery, following the official codification of race in our laws via the Virginia Slave Codes, as we talked about in episode three way back when, slavery became an undeniable source of phenomenal wealth. 
And why wouldn't it, right? Like if the goal is to cut down on the costs of producing a profitable item, then free labor is the ultimate way to cut down on one of the largest line items that most businesses have to budget for. It's really no surprise that rich, immoral fuckers wanted to take advantage of the human slave trade and also stimulate whatever race conflict that they could in order to maintain a level of separation between white workers who might catalyze a slave rebellion with their black comrades. Slavery was so profitable that by the eve of the Civil War, the Mississippi Valley was home to more millionaires per capita than anywhere else in the United States. Capitalism and the white supremacy that upheld it was working exactly as it had all been intended to. According to one of the articles that I read while I was doing my research leading up to this article, quote, given the choice between modernity and barbarism, prosperity and poverty, lawfulness and cruelty, democracy and totalitarianism, America chose all of the above. And, you know, barely two generations have passed since the formal end of American slavery, which isn't a whole lot considering that my grandmas are still alive on all three sides of my family, my mom, my stepdad, and my biological dad. And that represents three figures from two generations before me. And so that said, it's not surprising that we still feel <clears throat> the, the deeply rooted tendrils of slavery, which is inextric inextricably tied to the foundation of capitalism, just as clearly as we can feel that at its core, this economy is an abusive and exploitational system to this planet and to our people. Two historians wrote that American slavery is imprinted on the DNA of American capitalism, which is American capitalism is at the center of the story of Appalachian history and all that we have talked about when it comes to the mine wars. We've already talked about, I think it was way back in episode one, actually, um, we talked about how during the colonial age, tobacco was a crop that required a lot of labor and a lot of land, right? Well, cotton was very similar. A field could only tolerate a few years of a cotton crop before the soil became totally depleted and useless. So these rich, powerful colonizers who were profiting from the land on this so-called new continent at the expense of the labor of the folks that they shipped in as indentured servants and slaves like they had been doing since they needed all that labor from the tobacco era, they now, in addition to needing more labor, they needed more land to satiate their thirst for profit. So earlier in the colonies, when they had previously hacked the tobacco plant process, their situation was that they had plenty of land at that point, although not without risk. Um, but what they had was a labor shortage at that point, leading to the import of all the laborers that we discussed um, coming in from all of the poorer areas uh, of various continents. And now at this point in time, the powerful oligarchs had solved that labor shortage via legalized slavery. And now what they had was a land shortage, which they proceeded to solve by stealing millions of acres from Native Americans, a la forced removal, all throughout Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, and Florida. And then this, quote, government, end quote, turned around and sold that land on the cheap to white settlers for the equivalent 
of 38 bucks in today's dollars. What a fucking insult to the Native Americans who were forced to evacuate that land. But let's be clear about who these settlers were that were acquiring this property at such a steal. <laughs> Literally get it because it was stolen land. Anyways, naturally, the first to cash in on this oh so exciting opportunity were the middlemen, the businessmen, the investors, the companies that could afford to keep an eye out for such opportunities and have enough wealth on hand to invest on the fly. And remember how I mentioned that the Mississippi Valley was home to like a whole hell of a lot of millionaires compared to everywhere else? Well, the companies operating in Mississippi flipped land, buying it up at this extravagantly cheap price and selling it soon after purchase, commonly for at least double whatever they had paid. So then you've got this stolen land that is being sold multiple times, right? Through these layers of capitalism, people who are determined to make a profit. And then as they lay their crops, lush masses of Mississippi vegetation were torn up and replaced by a single crop. The origin of violence in American capitalism can be so explicitly observed in cotton plantations and how the planter class exerted their unwanted, grubby, greedy desires on the earth and the people who inhabited it. They forced away the land's caretakers, those indigenous communities who had prior inhabited this land. They violently exploited the labor of human beings deemed disposable and expendable, and they needlessly traumatized the local ecology all for profit. Floods became bigger and more common, something that more and more of us are experiencing in Appalachia as the climate crisis worsens. Shout out to our neighbors in eastern Kentucky and the area that was just devastated by horrific flooding. The lack of biodiversity exhausted the soil and to quote the historian Walter Johnson, it rendered one of the richest agricultural regions of the earth dependent on upriver trade for food. And even though the cotton plantation is one of the clearest examples of the violence that is inextricable from capitalism itself, it is certainly not the only example. And the violence of capitalism has by no means disappeared with emancipation, but we will get into that here in just a few minutes, don't you worry. But by 1835, the country was delivering nearly half the world's raw cotton crop as it harvested 500 million some pounds. Southern white elites grew rich, but uh, oh, wait, don't, we are not going to let our liberal Yankee friends to the north get off the hook as much as I know they would like to pretend like they are better than the folks down here in the south. Because the truth is that the textile mills in the northern states at the time were in a tight partnership with the southern plantations, kind of like the railroad companies and the coal companies were in later years. But we've touched on this before and we'll come back to it again. There was... In the words of one Massachusetts senator, an unhallowed alliance between the Lords of the Lash and the Lords of the Loom. There have been quite a few historians who try to portray plantation slavery as like pre-capitalistic and primitive even as a means of comforting and protecting themselves and us from the darker origin story of American economics and American politics. Not only were the exploitation and abuse of the land and the people replicated well into modern day practices, but plantation owners and operators were responsible for a lot of the common lines of thought and techniques in management that are 
thought to be best practices in the 19th century and well into today. When economic professionals cut corners to save on taxes or when middle managers spent their afternoons filling in Excel spreadsheets, that's all just rinse and repeat of the business procedures whose roots twist back to slave labor camps. Landowners aggressively expanded their operations to capitalize on on economies of scale that were inherent to cotton growing. Scale, more, bigger. They bought more enslaved workers to work the more lands that they were purchasing to make way for more cotton. They invested in large gins and presses that could save processing time. And they experimented with different seed varieties to figure out how to get the biggest bang for their buck. And in order to make all of this possible, the plantations developed complicated, intricate workplace hierarchies that combined these central offices made up of owners and operators and lawyers in charge of the allocation of money and long-term decision making with several departments and all these things that were operations uh, that they were responsible for. And one of the historians in my research described one plantation where An owner supervised a top lawyer who supervised another lawyer who supervised an overseer who supervised three bookkeepers who supervised 16 enslaved head drivers and specialists like bricklayers who supervised hundreds of enslaved workers. Everyone was accountable to someone else and plantations pumped out not just cotton bales, but volumes of data about how each bale was produced because they've got to know how to get the biggest bang for their buck, right? Like they've got to know how to make as much money as possible because that's what the whole point of this whole capitalist scheme is, right? Talk about the ultimate (laughs) pyramid scheme. I have talked about this previously on like my personal media, but I don't know if I've actually mentioned it yet on the show. Capitalism is just one big pyramid scheme. It's a bunch of folks like you and me at the bottom doing most of the work to produce a profit for this tiny group of people at the top. And in between us are all of these layers of middlemen, the insurance companies, the police and legal system, the for-profit healthcare industry, the higher education system, and on and on and on. This organizational structure was super advanced for its time. It had this hierarchical complexity that was really only replicated in large government structures like the British Royal Navy. But ultimately, this organizational structure resulted in what we see today as multi-level marketing schemes, which are the most transparent version of this. The planter class set the example for today's titans of industry by understanding that their profits went up when they could wring as much effort as possible out of each worker on their roster. So they had to pay close attention to metrics, which as a community organizer, metrics are something that I personally have a bit of a hate love relationship with more so just this general tension because of the emphasis that is put on metrics in so many electoral and issue based organizing settings that ultimately just turns organizing into this transformational which it turns the transformational intention of organizing into a transactional property and it leaves no room for nuance or recognition of human behavior in the social environment and I have a lot of thoughts on this subject but that is not what we came here to talk about so I will get off my soapbox. Because they paid such close attention to the metrics of inputs and outputs they had to develop this super precise system of record keeping and meticulous bookkeepers and overseers became just as important to the productivity of a slave labor camp as the field folks. The plantation class and their bookkeepers used their record keeping methods to determine end of year balances. They tallied their expenses and their revenues and noted the causes of their biggest 
gains and their biggest losses. They quantified all of the capital costs on their land, tools, enslaved workforces, and applied these recommended interest rates. They also developed very advanced ways of calculating depreciation by assessing the market value of enslaved workers over their lifespans and figured out that the values generally peaked between the prime ages of 20 and 40, but the and they also were individually adjusted up or down based on things like sex and strength and temperament. They reduced people to data points. And this is really interesting to me because, you know, this is something that like corporations who are trying to sell us products today have reduced consumers to data points in a lot of ways. And, you know, with my own personal experience being around politics and community organizing, it reminds me of how the current electoral system and our political campaigns also reduce human beings to data points based on our ideologies, our likelihood to vote due to our previous turnout patterns, our age, our party affiliation, all of this other stuff. And, you know, this was the kind of data that we would use to target voters for the political party. For I worked for the Democrats, but I am sure that the Republican Party has a very similar process. And it's how these political institutions get the most bang for their buck in a for-profit democracy. When you boil voters down to a metric along the lines of the amount of volunteer hours of engagement or marketing budget has to go towards targeting voters and ensuring that they... um, that they turn out for your candidate. I mean, this is one of my biggest issues with modern day politics. It is so transactional and dehumanizing, and it's why I'm so passionate about bringing the social work lens into politics to reintegrate evidence-based human behavioral theories and practices into community organizing where they rightfully belong. We are being traumatized on a mass scale by this excruciatingly violent force and all of the forces that support it and we need to be able to heal and defend ourselves on equally as large of a scale and anyways here it is in proof that the foundational idea of those metrics and boiling human beings down to a data point a metric that that idea is rooted in slavery and white supremacist capitalism Am I surprised? No. Is it nice to see what I've been feeling be affirmed in black and white while I was lost in my research rabbit hole? Abso-fucking-lutely. And the real interesting thing is that this analytical, detailed level of data capturing also allowed the planter class to anticipate rebellion. Tools, for example, were regularly accounted for to make sure that there were never a large number of <clears throat> potential weapons like axes or size going missing. And in this way, these bookkeeping measures simultaneously worked to maximize profit while also ensuring that violence only flowed in one direction, allowing for the minority wealthy elite to maintain control over a much larger group of enslaved and exploited workers. As slave labor camps grew increasingly efficient, enslaved black folks became America's first modern workers. Their productivity increased at an astonishing pace. As of 1862, the average enslaved field worker picked 400% as much cotton as their counterpart at the beginning of the 1800s, so just 60 years later. And modern technology has made it possible now for workplace supervision to be taken to new, overwhelming heights following in the lead of their white supremacist capitalist ancestors. Companies have developed software that rec- that records the keystrokes, mouse clicks, and 
random screenshots of their workers even. Modern day workers are subjected to drug tests, closed circuit video monitoring, tracking apps, and you know, the list goes on and on. And the core impulse behind this level of surveillance technology is rooted in that mindset of white supremacist capitalist plantations that sought complete control over the bodies and livelihoods of their enslaved workforce that they viewed as property. And using these fine-tuned data calculations to reap the highest possible profit margin from their workers involved a combination of incentives and punishments, but mostly just punishments. To the historian Edward Baptist prior to the Civil War, Americans lived in an economy whose bottom gear was torture. In this article, talked about how there's a level of comfort in attributing the sheer brutality of slavery to simple racism. And we kind of do this today when it comes to the brutality of modern day capitalism, right? Like we blame it on bigoted, poor white Southerners, poor white rural folks who are just filled with this invalid, irrational rage, right? But just like back then, how this article describes it, it wasn't the rage of the poor white Southerners, but it was the greed of the rich white planters. All of the violence that took place on the plantation wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't vengeful coming from poor white Southerners, but it was rational. It was capitalistic. It was all part of the plantation's design. And what I take away from this is that capitalism ultimately always has and always will rely on all of us to be complicit in that violence and in that abuse for it to succeed. But when we start to blame each other for simply being cogs in the machine, for being the ones engineering the process, then we're misdirecting our energy and we're just allowing the flow of abuse, exploitation, and murder to continue on. It's fueled by our blaming each other and using us against each other for the sake of maintaining that bottom line. As W.E.B. Du Bois put it, capitalism depended on slavery, not just to benefit the wealthy whites who obviously profited from free labor, but also capitalism used slavery to supplement poor white folks and white workers with what he called public and psychological wage, which allowed them to feel a sense of arbitrary entitlement and superiority by comparison under the value assignments of white supremacist capitalism. And at the same time, it boosted the bottom line even more than just providing free labor from the enslaved workforce, but that free labor served to pull down the wages of all workers. The hiring class had access to this large and flexible labor pool that was made up of both enslaved and free people. Laborers, the workers, they couldn't negotiate over the value of their labor when the bosses could choose between just outright buying entire human beings, renting them, contracting indentured servants, taking on apprentices, hiring children or prisoners, or any other means of exploiting human life for what at whatever minimal minimum cost that they could incur in order to produce that maximum profit. And this served to dramatically divide the workers and make all non-slavery kind of appear as freedom. White workers were convinced and reminded that their situation could always be worse because they were witnessing all of the horrors of slavery. 
And this served to force them to accept their own shitty conditions. Does this sound familiar? This version of freedom, the exact version of freedom that we have today, is a kind of freedom that keeps us out of physical chains and we aren't getting physically brutalized, at least, uh, you know, well, that's depending on who you ask, but it doesn't provide us with a means of survival necessarily. It doesn't provide us with bread or shelter. And what is freedom when we are denied life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Okay, so fast forward back to where we were in the context of the coal mines. If given all of this ADHD-fueled context, by some miracle, you are keeping up with my tangents and my offshoots, then at this point, it shouldn't come as any surprise to you that in the areas where there were coal miners, The upper class white folks looked at the miners as if they were animals. Remember our whole roots of capitalism? The word came from like that medieval Latin for livestock, property. That's the whole foundation of capitalism. And these upper middle class folks would look at the mine workers as if they were animals and treat them that way. And the mine workers knew that. Mine workers were treated and looked at as animals because to capitalism, that's what everything is. It's property. It's a thing. Capitalism saw slaves as property. It sees products of the earth, our natural resources, as as meant to be exploited for profit. Everything is property. Everything is an animal. That's the whole foundation of capitalism. And the leaves of this particular invasive species of abusive economics pop up all throughout our history, no matter how hard the people in power try to hide it or bury it, because they are never actually tearing it up at the root. So is this pseudo nation built on a foundation of violent capitalist colonization as it made its way to the turn of the century coal had become the central fuel for the engine of american industrial process to maintain the production of wealth for the rich power holders who had previously depended on tobacco and cotton to produce their wealth coal became necessary to run locomotives, factories, steamships, electric power plants, home furnaces even. It even helped to purify the steel that shaped the skyscrapers in the urban areas that today harbor so much resentment towards the rural communities that produced that coal. Coal and the workers who mined it, much like tobacco and indentured servitude, and like cotton and enslaved workers, those workers fueled the nation's enormous surge in wealth at that period of time. And much in the same way that the colonizers had depended on cheap and free labor to fuel the wealth produced by crops when they first got to this continent, they depended on cheap, exploited labor to continue to fuel their surge in wealth during the industrial coming of age. And the pattern continued from the 1600s to the 1700s and all the techniques that industrial elite had learned from their ancestors among the planter class and the enslavers before them, that carried into the 1800s as the first railroads began connecting the resources that capitalists depended on for their profits, which we touched on in episode seven. Increasing wealth brought increasing appetite for more wealth. There was always a demand for more. Again, that's the root of capitalism. Property, money at the center, at the front, always 
wanting more money. So when we think about the context of all the mine workers being perceived and treated as expendable property, it makes sense that African Americans who were migrating to West Virginia following the Civil War were able to get a more equitable footing than they could in other areas to the north and south of West Virginia. It makes sense that there were more black miners in West Virginia than anywhere else in the nation. And it made sense that black workers in the mines were able to gain access to a system that proclaimed equal pay for the same work as white folks. And let's remember that that isn't necessarily saying much since they were all working for money that could only be spent in the company store. Remember how we talked about that? And basically they worked for free anyways. Now, I know I've talked a lot about how the miners came together across race and culture to fight for a better life collectively. But don't get me wrong, there was still plenty of conflict and prejudice among the miners, especially at first because they didn't know each other. They were coming from all of these different backgrounds and there were a lot of malicious efforts to maintain and deepen that sense of distrust. Now, speaking of how capitalism always needs more, 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 I've talked about already in previous episodes how the mine operators needed to get more miners underground because the mines required a lot of heavy labor that often uh, resulted in injury or death, which meant there was a high turnover rate because of how dangerous the job was. And since they needed all of this labor, they would ship in poor, quote, white trash, end quote, from all over Europe, as well as bringing in African-American folks from down south. And naturally, the coal companies took full advantage of the differences between these groups of workers. They would exploit these differences and they would magnify these differences by building segregated coal camps with sections for black miners separate from sections for Eastern European European miners and separate from sections for the first and second generation Appalachian miners. And of course, all of this was done on purpose the coal operators needed that division to keep any kind of collective organizing at bay. They couldn't risk folks coming together to talk about their shared frustrations and maybe even realizing how much power they would have collectively as the entire means of production for the coal operators. And the whole idea of a union was to give individuals a way to come together to collectively fight against these monstrous, huge corporations that had immense strength. This was a feat that they could never accomplish on their own and that would require the unification of a union. So in addition to keeping workers segregated, West Virginia also became more or less an industrial police state as the coal operators and owners used totally unchecked power to dominate and beat any hint of union sympathies out of the miners that worked for them. Now, I already described what happened in the mine wars, and that's a dense story that I am not going to recap here because I'm already like 45 some minutes into this episode. But I do think I'm going to do a deeper dive at a later point in time, and you know, I'll keep y'all updated on that. But that said, the story of the West Virginia mine wars is a profound illustration of the core violence of American capitalism, a similar illustration to what we see, can see in the cotton plantations. And it was also a profound illustration of the people's belief in the rights that their government had claimed to guarantee to them 
and yet was being denied to them. The right to assembly, the right to free speech, the idea that working for somebody doesn't mean you sign your rights over to that person. Coal towns, much like the cotton plantations had served prior to emancipation, coal towns really served as an instruction ground for exploitation under capitalism with newfound emancipation. Mine workers took all the risks, bringing out hundreds of thousands of pounds of coal, producing wealth for the people that more than likely don't even live in their community. And I know I've talked about the coal towns in the past, but just to go into a little bit more sensory detail, if you will, coal towns were almost always unincorporated. And what that means is that in addition to all the things I've mentioned before about them owning the stores and the housing and creating their own currency and yada yada, it also meant that there were no elected officials in the town, no government police forces, and no so-called free market competition. It was literally a town that belonged to the owner and operator of the mine in that town. The only options that folks in the mines felt that they had once they were trapped in this horrific system was one, to keep their head down and do what they were told, which is something a lot of folks are feeling today. And that makes a lot of sense because it can feel like we are trapped in a very similar situation today. And the other choice that they had was to come together to unify with their coworkers, to stand up and fight. And the unionizing efforts were just that. They were unifying, unifying communities of the poor across race and culture and gender and other factors, even outside of the mines. The women, for instance, were involved in the labor struggle because they also had just as much at stake as the men in the mines. They had the survival of their families on the line. So the women provided much of the support network to keep the strikes going and they stood up to the company guards too. In one of, I was watching one documentary and this guy talked about how his grandma and his mom described There's nothing more vicious than a woman on a strike line. Supposedly, the women would gather outside the mine in mass and try to keep the scabs, that's, you know, the uh, replacement workers, from going in. And the women wouldn't necessarily be armed with guns, but with household utensils. And uh, I just love the symbolism of that. It really just gets me. And at the same time, The African-American folks who had been sold this lie under coal capitalism also fully engaged in the strike. To give a name to one of these folks, Dan Chain, also known as Few Clothes Johnson, he was one of the African-American organizers of the time who was known for being very good with both a gun and a fist. It didn't matter if they were black or white with strike breakers they were strike breakers. It wasn't a race matter. It was a class matter. And not because this was some kind of egalitarian utopia, but because there were clear pressing matters at hand. And it was clear that they could win their own survival, their shared interest in survival by coming together across those race lines. And the coal operators thought that there wasn't any chance that those groups would cooperate given all of the time and energy that they had put into division. But regardless of how segregated they kept the camps, everybody was still shopping at the company stores and everybody was still stuck underground together where they couldn't see anybody else's skin color because everybody was covered in coal dust. So everybody got to know each other and all those folks started coming together. And living in the coal camp, it became inevitable that you would 
come to feel a sense of community. The neighbors had no choice given the circumstances to look out for one another. Everybody knew everybody else's business. I mean, this reminds me so much of my own growing up in Appalachia where it literally took a village. We, I grew up with my cousins. We all grew up together. Everybody took care of everybody and nobody looked down on anybody else because they were all in it together in the mines and we were all in it together when I was growing up. There's one example that illustrates the solidarity of that the majority felt with the mine workers. There was the battle near Mucklow in June of 1912. And in that battle, the guards killed an Italian miner and they wounded an African-American miner. And the Baldwin Feltz men then decided to have the miners arrested and asked the grand jury to indict them. The audacity of those fuckers, I swear. But the grand jury ultimately refused and instead indicted the Baldwin men for the murder of the Italian miner. The case wasn't pushed by the prosecuting attorney, of course, because as we have talked about in our last episode, even with uh, Sierra, those systems are meant to protect and maintain the power and wealth of the ruling class. But the fact that everyday citizens stood on the side of the miners really says something. And the coal operators, I mean, they kept the coal camps separated, but they also, they would not hold back when it came to any tactic that they could try to use to keep the workers divided along race lines or whatever arbitrary criteria that could be exploited. In some of the earliest strike efforts, for example, the the dispute in the Marmot Mines in Putnam County was one that I read about in 1891, when miners would go on strike, the company literally imported African Americans as strike breakers. And, you know, this meant to accomplish two things. Of course, it meant to give miners to the the operators that could continue to produce a profit, but it also served to divide the labor movement by pitting black folks against white folks in the mines and vice versa. I mean, if they're all just trying to make a living and they all depend on that job to survive under capitalism, they're just using that to their advantage to pit these folks against each other. And in this way, working folks were divided across race lines and blinded to that common interest and that shared struggle. So much of the conflict and the tension around race is due to the practices of the wealthy elite like this one. So the coal operators in West Virginia were keeping all of these groups of workers separated based on race and culture to prevent coordinated efforts to unionize by any means necessary. And it was effective for a little while. I mean, we talked about in the previous episode uh, with Mother Jones and all that jazz where there was hardly any union presence in West Virginia for a long time until the union started an intentional effort to organize out there. And curious, curious, always ask why and follow the trail because, you know, what's interesting is that The coal operators up north and in the central region where the mines were already unionized, of course, they weren't fans of the union, but they also were not successful in getting the United Mine Workers off their backs. And that meant that all of those mines down south that weren't unionized had a huge competitive advantage in the market because they could undersell those northern operators. So, of course... The coal operators in the United States only had one option that they felt made any lick of sense. They had to encourage the union to organize West Virginia. I mean, if the union did its thing, it would mean that the southern operators would have their costs increase the same way that the northern operators could, and they wouldn't be able to undersell them as much. And if the union 
wasn't able to do its thing, then at least the northern operators would still be able to catch a break because the southern operators would face production shortages from strikes and negotiations, and they'd have all these extra expenses related to firearms and guards and all the other things that they would need to buy to uh, fight off the union efforts. So the coal operators in the north and the central part of the region were encouraging the union to organize down south. And yet, at the same time, you know, it was so much cheaper to operate a mine in those non-unionized coal fields of West Virginia. And because of that, it was super tempting for all of those uh, those operators, those same operators in the central and northern coal fields, they just couldn't help themselves. They also secretly bought into the mountains of West Virginia, setting themselves up for a win-win situation regardless of the outcome. Those sneaky, rich, powerful bastards are always rigging the game in their favor. And bonus surprise, around 1901, you started getting huge corporate interests moving into the state related to United States Steel. They bought up 300,000 acres of coal land, which they then turned over to the Norfolk and West Railroad, a subsidiary of Pennsylvania, which was tied to the Girard Trust Company of Philadelphia, which was connected to the Morgan Financial Pot Empire of New York. So following the money here, this situation in West Virginia coal was being determined by big city outsiders and investors. Okay, so I'm coming up on an hour for this episode and I've touched on a lot. So I'm going to try and pull the thread through, tie us up in a little bit of a bow as much as I can um, before I wrap up for today's episode. And so going back to the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek Mine Wars, remember when we talked about those? Well, at the time, do you recall how the government and really also during you know Blair Mountain and all of that, the government protected the interests of the corporate elite rather than the interest of the workers. Well, you know, that's really no not surprising at all considering for one there was not local government in the coal towns and then for two, uh the government <laughs> was bought and owned by the corporate interest much like it is today. You had this guy who was essentially the the mansion of the time whose name was Senator Clarence Watson of Fairmont who the miners accused of being the king of the state. Now, this guy was the president of the Consolidated Coal Company in Northern West Virginia. He owned more than 100,000 acres of land and employed 15,000 some non-unionized workers. And among his posse in the government was another senator, William E. Chilton who was the owner and manager of the Charleston Gazette media outlet and a law partner of William McCorkle. The partner, McCorkle, was a Democratic leader in the state Senate. And the law firm represented, by some estimates, four-fifths of the corporate interests in West Virginia, which meant that the union efforts were always bound to be fought by the government and the press in order to maintain those corporate interests, with the exception of a couple of labor papers out in the Kanawha Valley. So bringing it into the present day, traveling through time a little bit, as I love to do with my ADHD, let's look at modern day Senator Joe Manchin. Let's set the stage, shall we? There's a community called Grant Town that was built around one of the largest underground coal mines in the world. But since the mine closed in 1985, every other business has also shuttered, along with the school. 
and a lot of the buildings have been condemned. Despite the struggles that it's experienced, the community did have something valuable to outsiders. Mountains and mountains of gob. Yes, you heard that right, gob. Now gob, G-O-B, is an acronym for garbage of bituminous, I guess is how you say that, which is just waste coal. It's this low quality material that's dug from a mine that's mixed with rock and clay and that makes it really hard and less efficient to burn. And so for decades, dark gray gob has piled up on the ground outside the coal mines in West Virginia, often reaching several stories high. And there were corporate interests that wanted to make their home in Grant Town and profit off of dangerous processing of this gob for profit. Now the Environmental Protection Agency was concerned that this Grant Town plant was going to be too close to an existing coal burning plant and that would result in an excessive level of sulfur dioxide which would be a threat to human health and plant life according to public documents. So at the very beginning of his career Mr. Manchin helped to win a permit for the plant in Grant Town by negotiating with existing plant owners and other lawmakers. And then after he did that, Mr. Manchin went on to profit from it. While in elected office on a state level, Mr. Manchin urged his fellow state lawmakers to back a tax credit for power plants that burn gob, which passed the following year. Only three plants in the entire state burned gob, and Grant Town was one of them. Then, after Manchin ascended to a position where he could influence national policy, coincidentally, his family business began earning even more revenue. Mr. Manchin, from a seat on the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources had an ability to shape federal policy governing oil, gas, and coal. In 2020, Mr. Manchin's power reached totally new heights where he was able to block the spending bill that contained climate proposals, which of course included uh, penalties for power companies that didn't reduce their coal use. Grant Town, at that point being the only remaining power plant in Manchin's state that burned gob, would have been put out of business by the federal climate rules. Manchin and his wife owned assets worth anywhere between $4.5 million to $12.8 million in 2020, according to the Senate financial disclosure forms. And the bulk of Mr. Manchin's reported income since entering the Senate has come from one company, InterSystems, which he founded with his brother in 1988, weirdly enough, the year before the Grant Town Power Plant got their permit from the state of West Virginia. So weird. And now maybe this seems unrelated, but the point is that the violence continues into this day. West Virginia's folks living in coal towns that have been abandoned strategically by our elected officials and our so-called government, folks are still suffering. Folks are still fighting for survival. We are still fighting for survival out here in Western North Carolina. And 
we still are seeing a situation where the government and corporations are intertwined in the same and they constantly rig the game to work in their favor. In the same way that the northern coal operators had their toes dipped in both encouraging the union efforts and buying into the coal fields of West Virginia, I would say that the oligarchs have done the same thing. These abusive capitalists have done the same thing with our electoral system. They plan to win no matter who actually ends up winning the elections, right? Like Joe Manchin is supposedly a member of the Democratic Party and yet somehow is able to use his power to undermine the Democratic agenda in such a way that people who profit off of exploitation of labor and land are able to continue to maintain that profit. The status quo is maintained. That's the whole point of rigging the game, right? There's not going to be any significant change. And we have a choice just like these union organizers had a choice or, or really, I mean, I should say the, the coal miners had a choice to either keep their head down and just try and get through the day to day and survive. So that's our choice. We can do that. Or we can make the other choice, the choice that they ended up making. And we can come together and we can start to organize across our differences. We can start to see that our differences actually make us a lot stronger. We can start to see that we actually have so much more in common that we've ever been led to believe. And that is when we can unleash real power. And we don't have to be part of a freaking trade union to do it. We the people are the means of production under late stage capitalism here in 2022. And this week, I've just been so frustrated with seeing how obvious it is that this is such an unsustainable, violent system. I went to the grocery store the other day and my kid only drinks almond milk and a damn gallon of almond milk at the grocery store was $5.50 with my Ingalls Advantage card. I was like, what? That is just, we, we have a choice and we don't have to accept this violence. And on that note, I think this is a great place to stop for today. I have been on my soapbox for quite long enough. And honestly, this is a subject that I don't ever know that I'll truly be able to stop talking about because there's never a good stopping place when we're talking about stuff that is still happening and can be observed in every detail of our lived reality. But I digress. That wraps up today's episode of Rednecks Rising. In the show notes, I'll be dropping the links to the references that I used uh, for the research of this episode. And of course, I'll be dropping a link to my friends over at Tail Light Rebellion so you can check out their music as well. Thanks to all y'all out there who are listening and who have made it this far. And I guess since you did make it this far, we owe y'all a little treat. So, Chris. What's the answer to today's trivia question? Give the people what they came for. So today's question was, the name Appalachian was not commonly used for the entire mountain range until the late 19th century. What was it known as before then? I have no clue. The answer is the Allegheny Mountain. Oh, okay, wait a second. Haven't I heard of that somewhere before? There's still a specific region of the Appalachian Mountains that are called the Allegheny Mountains. Yep, that checks out. I feel like I've heard of it somewhere in Georgia or something like that. Yeah, it's actually in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and eastern West Virginia. (laughs) Well, I was totally wrong, but nonetheless, I learned something new today. Thank you so much, Christopher, and thanks all of y'all for listening to the podcast. Take care and we'll be back next week.